hello everyone. I hope like you all had a very nice lunch. So, uh, as a non-native English speaker, uh, I frequently do a lot of mistakes. And so, back in November, like by the 25th of November, it was the deadline to apply to this conference. So, of course, I actually submit my application on the 25th of November. And uh, I almost submit that, as, uh, submit that as the title of my talk, Exploding Posterous Power. So, fortunately, I realized just a few seconds before clicking the button. So, this talk is not about uh, making things to blow with Elixir or Postgres. It's actually about exploiting Postgres po power with Elixir and, and Ecto applications. Uh, so, uh, my name is Jose, or uh, Jose, like the famous one, but I'm way less famous. Um, I've been programming for around uh, 10 years, uh, but actually started playing with Elixir three years ago. And uh, I started using it uh, for my previous job like two years ago professionally. Uh, pretty cool experience. So, at the beginning of this year, I found myself looking for a new job. And yeah, you know, you have to go to this all recruitment process. And I actually ended up working at Wunder Mobility in Hamburg, in Germany. So uh, at first I have to thank them because I just joined three weeks ago and they actually are sponsoring this trip, which is pretty cool. And uh, fun fact, I actually joined to work in a new product, which is actually a reading in TypeScript. Uh, but well, let's see if I could make something to put some Elixir there as well. So uh, let's get into the business. Uh, so the last two days has been quite interesting. Like we have been watching a different, like different talks, quite high level. So we have been like talking about uh, Gen Stage, uh, Gen Flow, Broadway, uh, distributed uh, applications, resilient applications. This morning talk, this keynote of Witchcraft. So very pretty, pretty cool, high level stuff. But in my experience, like when you join a team or you are working on a product, the first thing you have to uh, tackle or work with is like the definition of the domain model and you have to sort out some kind of access management in your uh, application. So um, when you go through this problem, usually more or less you follow like different steps, which I'm just going to list right now. So first, it uh, doesn't matter which language you are using, but of course for the matter of this presentation, I'm going to be focused on Elixir. Uh, you kind of set up a new application, a new environment, so we use Mix for that in Elixir. Uh, you create, hopefully you create a new role uh, and database in your Postgres server or Docker container. And I say hopefully because most of the time you see people using just the Postgres user in the Postgres database. Um, you set up your Ecto and the Postgres adapter, and then you start like okay, working on this domain, domain model, and you try to find the data structures which actually cover the different user cases or the different the different users case and the different roles you have in your application. So then you uh, try to pick up some of those use cases. Maybe you do it by yourself. You're working in a small startup, or you have a product owner or somebody else in the business who tell you uh, which are the priorities. And then hopefully, if you're using some kind of testing strategy, uh, either test-driven development or behavior-driven development, you try to design your API of how are you going to actually cover those use cases. Um, and then you're ready for, for, for implementation. So you first translate your data structures or your domain to, to Ecto schemas, and then you're ready to uh, write the implementation. So uh, at this point, you probably find that, yeah, I need some kind, you need some kind of access management because I have, I define different data structures, I define different resources, and I have different kind of users, so those users cannot actually execute the same operations or uh, they cannot do exactly the same over all the resources I have in my application. Doesn't matter if you are doing a database application, a race API, or a GraphQL application. So basically, this required access management, which could have different names, which like they formally have some, there are some difference between those three names, but more or less what you are translating these names are into this, the, the following data structures, which are users, uh, groups on roles, and permissions policies or privileges, 
Once again, there are some differences between these terms, but more or less, uh, in the majority of cases, they uh, represent uh, the same. So, for example, in the case of groups and roles, like in a very simple uh, access management system, the, it's something that you, uh, you use to put together a group of users and assign permissions. So you know that all the users which have this specific group or role, they could access or they could operate over certain kind of resources. So uh, once you have this clear in mind that you have some kind of access management, you know that you need a layer in your business logic that uh, take care of which resources uh, could be accessed by the current user. The current user could be a real human interacting, a real human being interacting with your API or with a front-end application, or it could be another other machine which is also consuming your API or any way of communication you have in your application. Uh, so let's see an example of this. So uh, when I start like researching or like putting together this talk, I start looking for uh, sample databases which I could use to to uh, try or to experiment with these concepts. So I end up looking for finding this Chinook database. Uh, kind of fun, like this is what you find, what you, you get as a result when you look in Google. Um, just a bunch of these weird helicopters. Uh, so no, I mean like, it's not about the Chinook database, it's not about helicopters at all. It's actually, uh, Chinooks is like the name of some kind of winds in, the, in North America, and the developers decide to use this name because at the moment there was another database which was called Northwing, and well, you know, we developers like to name things in a funny way. So um, this database is basically like uh, it was built from extracting information from iTunes. Um, it was originally created for uh, MySQL. So um, as a consequence, uh, it's not following some of the Postgres convention conventions, like for example, the table names and the column names are all capitalized. And usually in Postgres, you have all uh, lower case. Uh, as like what this database is kind of like simulating is the business model of iTunes where you have a customer and uh, an employee which is a representative assigned to that customer and then you have artists, albums and tracks which you can uh, buy in, in iTunes. For the sake of brevity and for this demonstration we're just going to stick to customer, employee and uh, invoice. So let's let's uh, imagine that we have this use case where we need some way to list all the customers that we have in our database. Uh, and we're going to put like, during the definition of this domain model, we realized that we needed four kind of users. So we have the admins, which basically can access all the customers in the system. We have the supervisors, which can access customers, could, could access, the supervisors are employees, which can access all the customers who are assigned directly to them or who are assigned to other employees called agents that report to them. We have the agents, which are basically the representative as well, uh, which can access the customers assigned to them, and then we have the customers uh, themselves. So let's look at some code. We just start like with pretty basic stuff, so we're just like mapping this Chinook uh, employee table to an uh, Ecto schema. We just I just I just pick up some of the fields like first name, last name, and title. And the important thing is those uh, associations. We have an association which is actually recursive. It's, I mean, it's an association to employee because one employee reports to another employee. And then we have also an association to user, and I'm going to talk about that later. We do the same for customers, who has, like, we have first name, last name, and then we have an association to the representative, which is actually an employee, and another association to user. So what we're putting together is a way to, uh, we are saying that co both customers and employees are users, are going to be users in uh, our system. So let's see how can we solve this. There's a first approach. The first approach is like the most common approach when you try to, to uh, put together something simple is like you create this user table and uh, you put in this user table a roll column. So when creating this user table, we're just like running an electron migration here that just create a table called user, email, and role. And there is something else which I actually did in another migration uh, that's adding the foreign keys from uh, both customer and employee to the user table. 
Um, this is just a translation to the, of that new table to an extra schema, and the most important part here is what this valid roles is doing. So this valid roles is the definition of the four different roles I have in my database, um, or, or the, the four valid uh, roles that I have in my user case. Um, that's, that's like the way I'm going to use in this first approach to list the customers. So this code doesn't look very well because I tried to fit it on the, on the slide. But uh, basically what we're doing here is that I define a helper, which is called, it's, it's actually defined a Chinook helpers customer. And what this helper is doing is pattern matching depending on a user that you pass an, as an argument. It checks which role that user has defined, and then it executes the database query that requires, uh, that you require to uh, retrieve that user. For example, in the case of supervisors, we are, this query, what it's doing is joining with a table uh, employee twice to get both the customers assigned to the supervisor and also the customers assigned to other employees which reports to this supervisor. Similarly, we do the same for uh, agent and customer, and then we have a, a, a default case, which is basically what is covering the admin users. So yeah, we have, we have listing customers for every kind of user uh, in our system, and it works, but we probably will find ourselves doing this for every uh, resource in our system or every kind of use case we have in our application. And the granularity of the access control is really, really limited. So what does that mean? We have four roles, and then we, we have, uh, for example, now a new use case which requires that some supervisors uh, can see customers which are actually doesn't belong to the supervisor but to other supervisors. So he can read those customers, but, they, but he cannot or she cannot modify them. Then our structure is kind of like, uh, like uh, this current approach is not enough. We might find ourselves creating a new role, but that's not maintainable, that's not scalable. So let's think about a second approach. And then we're going to here use an approach that uh, it's pretty common by many frameworks or tools that has been around for years, like Django. There are many Node.js libraries. And I think there is something in Elixir as well. They just kind of help you to, to boilerplate groups and permissions. So you define two, two new tables, groups, uh, groups and permissions. So this time, I'm going to skip the migrations, and I'm going to go directly to the schemas. We have a group table, uh, which basically contains a name. And it has two many-to-many uh, -many associations, a many-to-many -many associations to the user table that we created before, and a many-to-many -many association to the permission table. Similarly, we have the permission table, um, which only contains a name and time stops. And we updated our user schema. And now, instead of using that role that we were using before, we want to use the concept of group as role. So we also create associations from the group and from the permission to the uh, different tables, group and permission. So this was good, and then, OK, now I need to find a way to determine uh, whether a user is, uh, belongs to a certain group. So because the inf that information exists within my user's schema, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually an association within my user's, uh, within, within my user's schema, I'm just going to define some helpers, which uh, gonna make me uh, going to make easier to determine whether this specific group or whether this specific user is a member of a group. And now I could modify my all helper function. And I just want to make sure that every time I call the all helper function, that first line is preloading the group, because it's what in this user use case I want to evaluate. And then I just define some kind of priority. So a user could be on different groups. Here in the, in the business logic of my application, I am um, separating and, and, and saying, OK, if this user is a member of the admin group, that has the higher priority. So I need, I'm going to call this private function called do all, saying that this is an admin user. And the same applies for supervisor, agent, and user. 
it's important to notice that I'm doing this on, at the helper level. So this is probably where you will find your, where you find your Phoenix applications. You have kind of like this logic in your controllers, and maybe you are using some packages like uh, um, Canada, Canary, or X permissions, where basically is you get the user information, and usually the user information is not retrieved at the authorization level, but at the authentication level. Um, and then you make sure that according to the information of the user, you validate if he could or not, she or he could access that resource. Um, so just to, to give you an idea, what we are actually doing in the private functions is exactly the same queries that we were doing in the first approach. Nothing has changed at this level. It's only on the layer above that we have, that we are now determining whether the user could see certain information or no. So once again, once again, it works. But uh, in this case, uh, you might think, OK, there are, certain, there are certain problems with this. What if we want to split the application per domain? Or uh, we, keep, we, we, want to, we have this monolith that we are now separating into more like a components architecture or even a microservice architecture. Or what if we need to implement this part in a different language because uh, for like business reason, there's happened to be certain library which has better support to this use case on, on a certain language. Or for example, like I, I, we have been using or we have been writing this application uh, in Python or Ruby for years and we now want to switch uh, to Elixir, either doing a full rewrite or just taking out some components of the application and implementing again. So you'll find yourself re-implementing this access management uh, uh, to your resources. I mean, there are some alternatives to avoid the re-implementation, but all of them require more code and require uh, more software to maintain. And most importantly, one thing you're gonna realize is that uh, your the application is like continuously for every resource or for every data structure you have in your application, you are continuously repeating these two steps. You are retrieving the user and all the metadata of that user, which are groups and permissions, but you are also, and you are also processing that information as we saw in the previous slide, uh, to decide what, which kind of query you need to execute to retrieve the resources from the database that that specific user could uh, could read or could update, insert, or sorry, could read, update, or delete. So let's think about another approach. And I'm going to call this approach, let's use Postgres. Postgres, uh, by default, sorry, uh, it has these three different structures. Um, entities, functionalities, which are called role, uh, privileges, and role level security. So let's start with role. Uh, in Postgres, a role is basically an entity which can own or which, which can have different privileges over database objects. So what we're going to do here is that we're going to map those four users that we have in our use cases, and we're going to create a database role. So I'm going to create a, a role which is called Chinook Admin, a role that's called Chinook Supervisor, Agent, and Customers. And actually, I have a fifth role, which is called Chinook App. This role, I'm granting access, and the second part of this code, as you can see, this is a Ecto migration, so I'm defining this inside my Elixir application. Uh, I have this user, Chinook App, and this user is actually the one that I'm using to configure the Postgres adapter. So when you go to your configuration, doesn't matter where you have it, of your Postgres repository, you have there the Chinook App and the password. Uh, so, to continue working on this, I have to go back and check and take my user from the first approach, and I'm going to use again that role column that we defined before. But what I want to achieve in this case is that the values of that role column, I don't want to have them, to have or validated on my schema. I want those roles to be the roles that are defined inside the database, inside Postgres. So unfortunately, and not unfortunately, because there are performance and security and consistency reasons behind that, uh, Postgres does not allow you to create references or foreign keys from, any, from a table defined by the user to the PG roles table, which is the table that where actually all the roles live. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to emulate that. And we're going to emulate that using a database trigger. So we're going to create this trigger, which is called uh, ensure use role at sys. And this trigger, what it's basically doing is that every time you insert in the database uh, or data in the database one of these app users that we created, we're going to execute this function, which is uh, actually a Postgres function. It's called check role assist. And this function is going to check, OK, this uh, a string or text that you are passing me by match one of the PG roles in the database. If it does, it moves forward. If it doesn't, it rolls back the transaction. So it's kind of like emulating a constraint. Um, so now we move forward, and then now we need, we're going to use this concept of privileges. So privileges in uh, in Postgres are basically access to the roles to certain ta tables and operations. So in this setup, once again, I'm creating a migration, and this migration is giving a lot of information about, uh, about th th sorry, this migration is actually giving a lot of access to the roles. So basically, I'm giving access to the app user, customer, and employee table for all the users, is set customer, and actually I'm giving access to any kind of operation. So it's quite permissive, probably in a real environment in the real world, I will try to restrict this a little bit more. And that actually is going to lead us to the most interesting part, which is role-level security. So role-level security is a functionality that was included uh, in Postgres 9.5. And basically, it's about creating restrictions over the tables, as the privileges does. But instead of the whole table, you are creating restrictions, restrictions over a specific rows on the table. So you are telling the database that you're going to restrict the access to a, to a given role or to whatever for a, a specific set of rows given a condition that you define. How do we do that? Uh, first, we need to, uh, we're going to start using or creating a configuration parameter in the database. So this configuration parameter is just altering my database and actually uh, defining uh, a configuration parameter called Chinook, Chinook app user. And I'm going to set this Chinook app user to zero because I'm expecting to have their user IDs. The user IDs are the primary keys of the user table, which happen to be uh, integers or big integers. Um, so when the, the default value, value is zero, it means that there is not current user currently set in the database. How do we use that? So now we get to the concept of policy, which is the role level security part. So what we want to create is a policy that restricts the access to our customers, uh, given the kind of role, of database role, that I am currently using. So for example, for the case of admin, the policy is quite simple, because the, the admin has access to everything. So uh, I'm delimiting and saying, like, basically, for every role, it's true. For supervisor, which is probably is, the, is actually the most uh, complex case, what we're doing here is to write again that query that we had before in Ecto, but we're writing the query now in, S, in SQL. So that parameter that we defined before, which is called Chinook app user, you can find it now there. And what we're, do, what we're saying is that every time uh, somebody queries this table, if the user is a supervisor, make sure that these conditions apply. So as you can see, the result of the query is actually uh, true or false, or like you're looking is to validate that condition. We're going to do the same for the agent. It's the same query, once again, that we define in Ecto, but now in uh, SQL. And uh, finally, we do it for the customer, which is, once again, the most simple one. So uh, just like uh, to, to, to be clear on how are we defining this, all these policies are going to be defined in Ecto migration. So you are not getting out of your application. You are still on the migrations. And uh, I'm just defining a migration that executes all of those create policy commands of Postgres. In this case, I had to put in on uh, sigils because, um, because the tables, like, yeah, because the table names and parameters are with quotes. If I didn't use if I don't use sigils, I have to escape all the quotes, and it was kind of ugly. Uh, okay, so now we get to the interesting part. 
you already saw the queries where, that we use to create these policies, but in the queries I was using these uh, Chinook app user parameters. So how do we set that? Um, to actually, to actually um, understand how does this work, like you, you need to consider that when you connect to a Postgres database or a Postgres adapter, you are under the hood. What is uh, what uh, Ecto is using is this uh, package called uh, DB connection. So DB connection, every time you connect to a Postgres, it opens by default. You can actually change the parameter. It opens ten connections to the database, ten different connections, and those connections are. Uh, locating in a pool. So every time you request a database, Ecto or DB connection pool actually give you one of the connections, and those connections translate to Postgres sessions. So every time you open a connection with the database or you open a new session, that configuration parameter that we defined before, Chinook app user, is set to zero because we said that that's the default value. Uh, Postgres allow you to do two different things. Either you change the value of that configuration parameter for the given section, or you change the value of the configuration parameter inside a transaction. And that's what we're actually going to do here. We here are using, so you see at the first function, set local parameter. We are do, using this command, which is set local configuration parameter equal value. And the idea of this is like, uh, every time we run a transaction, we're going to set the uh, Chinook app user parameter, and then we're going to do the same for the role, which is actually the last function in this slide. So it's set local role. It's kind of like a similar convention, but instead of setting a parameter, I'm going to set a role. How do we use this? Uh, we're going back to this helper that we have been using uh, since the first approach is this function called all. And in this case, the function still is receiving the user struct or the user schema. But now what the function is doing is just creating a repo transaction. Once again, this repo transaction is created uh, using um, Ecto. And this repo transaction, the first two things it has to do is to set which is the local role and then set what is the local parameter. So the local role is, getting, is being obtained from the Ecto user structure. And because this Ecto user structure is using, a, the database is using a trigger, I'm 100% I'm sure that that role is going to exist in database. Um, in the case of set local parameter, I'm just setting which is the user ID or the integer that is related to this specific user. And then finally, I'm just executing a very simple query, which is repo that all customers. So on my Elixir code, I don't have any of the query definition on how, wh whether this user could actually um, could actually see these customers or no. That definition relies now on the, on the database. And that means that for every resource I have on my application, I could replicate this. Of course, kind of like it, there, there, there could be a better way to write this. For example, you can create either a macro or a function, which makes sure that the transaction set this before, uh, before any query. So you don't have to take care of that in the code. But the cool thing is that we have uh, extract the access management logic from our application. And now that relies uh, on the database. So for example, if now you need to request all the customers who spend, uh, that spent at least 1,000 years last year, your, the logic on your application or the query on your application that you need to write it's only limited to that logic. Get me the customer which spent at least 1,000 years. Now, what the database is going to return is the customer that spent at least 1,000 years, but also the customers that your the, the giving user or your current user could actually uh, see according to the policies that you defined before. So, uh, as a disclaimer, this talk is not about replacing Ecto. This, place, this talk is about a different way of using Ecto uh, and Postgres. And it has some advantages. Like in most of the cases, and please notice most of the cases, uh, the role level security could be actually faster than implementing that ourselves because it could be faster in, in terms of milliseconds of performance time, but it could be also be faster in terms of development. 
And that kind of lead me to the second point, which is uh, you have only one sort of true for uh, access management. What does that mean? That if I, I, have, I have an architecture which has different components, I don't need to replicate that in different languages or in different projects. The database is taking care of that. Even if you are using microservices and you have completely isolated database for every for each of your microservices, the access management could be ta could be taken care of by the Postgres database unless you have a very use, a specific user case. You might argue that you, you, for example, in your microservice architecture, you have an identity and authorization management service, which takes care of that. That's cool. That's another use case. But most of the times, you can actually delegate to that, that to the database and let, let the business or lift your application, left for your application the business logic. Uh, what actually translate into writing simpler business logic in your app. Of course, as everything in software engineering has some trade-off, uh, you could have some performance problems. For example, especially if you are defining very, very complex uh, policies or very complex, uh, very, very complex uh, access management system, uh, you might find yourself that any query to the database needs to translate into the database planning this extra query defined by the policy, and that could li that could actually. Um, translate into lower lower queries. At the beginning of the, when, when they released this on Postgres 9.5, there were many performance issues, but now on Postgres, after Postgres 11, is really, really fast. They make a lot of uh, a lot of improvement. And also the cool thing is that even if like you can actually do query optimization over your uh, your policy, because in that using that we saw before, when, when we define the policies inside that using, you can put whatever you want. You can call a function of a PG uh, SQL function. So you can optimize as much of as you can in, uh, in that sense. Uh, the second point is that it might not suit your use case. That's true. Like, for example, yesterday we had this, this very cool talk about um, uh, distributed applications, and the speaker mentioned that th because they were building a chat application, they are required to go on a way where they, 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 they for them, it was OK to be eventually consistent. So they, of course, they don't need an, a consistent database as possible. So yeah, this might not be your use case and might not be useful for you. And the third. The third point is that you and your team need to learn more about SQL and Postgres. And yeah, we sometimes have to learn so many things that it could feel a little bit overwhelming. Um, but I kind of feel that this is not 100% a trade off. This is like saying that uh, learning Elixir. Uh, might be uh, or learning OTP might be a trade-off because it's more things to learn. So I think like if you're doing Elixir and you learn OTP, you have some benefits or advantage from that. So I think it's more or less the same case. So to wrap it up, the takeaways I want you to take from this from this uh, presentation is. Uh, if your application flow relies in database, like your database is doing a lot of operations with the, with uh, sorry, your application is doing a lot of operations with a Postgres database, moving the access management down there might actually uh, be a good option. So it's something that you could definitely consider, and I promise you, you will be able to optimize queries directly in Postgres uh, in a way that you cannot do uh, in Ecto. And not, it's not because Ecto is bad. It's because Postgres is designed for that. And even if you don't use roles, privileges, or RLS, uh, role level security, explores, explore Postgres functionality. So as a bonus, there is a way to actually push this way forward. Uh, there is this concept called GSQL. So GSQL is something, an idea that I think has been around for many years now. And a few years ago, I think two years ago, somebody doing like a guy working on Clojure created this library for Clojure where you can actually define all your queries in SQL. And then you read those queries, you compile those queries, and then you call those queries from Clojure. Um, there are some people which already work in this for Elixir. There's like this first project called GSQL. And the second one is actually a former colleague of mine. Uh, he wrote uh, 
ISQL. So basically, you define if you have a very, very complex query, which is really hard to define in Ecto, you just go and define that query in SQL, and then you put a name over that query, and then you basically could read that information, compile it, and call it from your Elixir code. And because Ecto allows you to load information from rows or from, from a list of tuples to an actual extract, you could basically have the same that you would have if you go directly through, uh, through Ecto. So uh, first, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make public the code I, all the like the first the three approach I did during the research for this talk later in this this URL and some advertisement uh, working for Wunder. We are hiding. We actually have a team doing Elixir. It's the carpooling team. My colleagues are all over there. So if you are interested and in looking for a new job opportunity, please come to me after the talk. And in the words of Hannibal Lecter, thank you. We have a little time for some questions. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I had a question because you've mentioned that it might be uh, advantages when you use multiple languages. Um, but if we're using only Elixir, I wanted to ask how do you keep uh, consistent all your policies? For example, let's say that the policy changes and now you have the data about policies scattered across multiple migrations because uh, they are in, in different files and different migrations. And the usual approach, the previous approach that you've showed, everything is in code in one place. How do you deal with that? Yeah, so um, I would say like for to solve that problem is, is basically like every change you do to the database. is a, like every migration that you run in your database either is a policy or something else. You have it when you're, when you're doing the migrations through Elixir or through Ecto migrations, you have, you have it scattered in different files. So one solution to that is actually move your migration system out of uh, Elixir, which honestly I'm very fan of doing this because I think that uh, Migration is something that does not need to be on, on Ecto. But yeah, I understand that if you are using Elixir and you don't, you want to keep your code base as consolidated as possible. That's a problem that, at least right now, I don't see how can you solve it. You're always going to have it on different files. Cool. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Very interesting. I was wondering if you, what are your thoughts on using this approach for? Uh, multi-tenancy. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting question because my my current my current my new product new product I'm working on we are basically dealing with that problem. We need to support multi-tenancy, and so I think that uh, when you are creating a product which might change a lot and which might support a lot of users. Uh, this is definitely this is definitely something you uh, you could consider as a very as a very good option in the long term. However, if you are working right now on multi-tenancy, that's actually our case. We are trying to define the multi-tenancy, and our product is not mature enough to understand if we are covering all the all if we are covering the majority of use case of multi-tenancy. Uh, I would I would prefer to keep that on my code code until I feel comfortable enough to push it down. So you could actually you can always experiment. This could be like different rounds of, rounds of iterate of iteration or improvement. The first one you define the sort of things in the code and then you move to database once you feel comfortable with them. Cool. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I do not have a question. It's more like an annotation. Uh, in our application, almost 20 years ago, we chose almost the same path as you did. And now, uh, years later, we came to the conclusion this wasn't such a great idea, because since then, uh, we, uh, we, are in, we want to switch databases, and we found our application is really t uh, coupled, coupled to the uh, database. So from now on, I would rather keep the 
uh, database as stupid as possible and move all of this up to the application layer. Uh -huh. But that's, of course, just an opinion. Yeah, no, no. It's, it's, I think it's completely valid. You can you can also say say some contra argument that it basically applies for the same to the programming language. Like 20 years ago, you choose to do your program in Java, and now all your code base is coupled to Java, and now you have to write it in a new technology. So I, I, I understand, and that's why I say it might not fit your use cases. Thank you very much for the annotation. All right, uh, any other questions we can have? We can follow up in the hall. And uh, let's hear it one more time for Jose. There's somebody over there, I oh, think. one more? Yeah, down in the front, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to skip anything, I really. <laughs> Getting my exercise on these stairs. I'm just going to remove Hannibal Lecter face because it's quite ugly. So. <laughs> hey, thanks for the talk. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you can uh, use this RLS for making a differentiation between allowing to read and allowing to update. As yeah, well. yeah, yeah. Actually, I think I forgot to mention that. You know, um, when they created the policies, uh -huh. I was using this using. Yep. And Postgres has uh, like a secondary statement which is called with check. So then you separate. Uh, which row you want to show on reads and which rows can actually be modified by that role. All right. It's cool. totally possible. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. All right, let's hear it one more time for Jose. Thank you very much.